Let's open our Bibles up tonight. Genesis chapter number 4. Verse number 1, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, in the east, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. And he built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. You know, it's amazing how the Lord uses parables and events in the Bible. And oftentimes he does what he does in this passage, how he uses these characters, these first uh, boys that are born on the earth, and we can obviously learn a great deal from just contrasting and comparing Cain and Abel. So I want us to look at these two boys tonight, and these two men, I should say, because young boys will grow up to be young men. And these are two different, uh, two different men, different as night and day. I think about uh, Adam and Eve and how that back in chapter 3, verse number 21, the Bible says that God made coats of skins and clothed them. So from my perspective, I see that God killed a lamb and he did that in order to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. So they passed that down to their sons so they would have some type of understanding about a blood sacrifice or at least when Abel brought his blood sacrifice, God respected that. Fire comes down and consumes it. We have that from several other passages in the Bible. There's about seven times in the Bible where that happens, where God shows that he's pleased with that offering. And so at that point, Cain knows I'm supposed to be bringing a blood sacrifice, at least at that point. However, I think if I was to bet, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would say Adam and Eve told their boys, this is how you approach God. This is what he requires, a blood sacrifice. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. And so be that as it may, we have two different men that grow up here. We have, obviously, a contrast here. Abel's the good guy. He's the godly guy. He's the man of faith. He's the caring, compassionate man who worships God. And he wants to do what God wants him to do. And he wants to approach God how God wants him to approach him. Cain, on the other hand, is a wicked selfish, jealous person who does his own thing. And he's a man of the field. He's a man of the ground. He's a man who just wants to go about and carry about his business the way he wants to do it. And he is the victim and he is entitled. And so we see a contrast between these two men. I want us to look at this thing tonight, just a few points, and hopefully draw a contrast and maybe take some application because I'm telling you, Inside of every one of us, there's a Cain and there's an Abel. Now, if you want to take this type a little bit further, uh, I've got another message I preach called Raising Cain. <laughs> and people talk about that. And, of course, Cain's the first man. The first man is of the earth, earthy. 
The first man that you have is the old man. That's your old flesh. When Jesus Christ came inside of you when you were born again. That's the new man on the inside. He hadn't been in there as long as the old man. So the older brother is always worse in that sense. So Cain is raising Cain, and you can obviously take a contrast and say, you know what, I can give in to the old man or I can give in to the new man. And I need to do what the new man wants me to do because the new man is Jesus Christ in me. And so obviously we can take some personal application. But let's look at this thing. First of all, I want you to see in just the first few verses here, Abel is a keeper and Cain is a tiller. Abel is a keeper and Cain is a tiller. I think about Abel, he is somebody who builds up. He has those sheep and he raises them and he supples them and he takes care of them. And he builds up and he nurtures Cain goes out and he tears stuff up. I kind of like Cain in some respect. I like getting a piece of ground and tearing it up. Taking some trees and chopping them down, burning stuff. Amen. Light it up, burn it up, tear it up, dig it out, root it out. That's Cain. Abel is a nurturer. He has got the long vision. He's thinking about the flock and he's thinking about how he can nurture them and raise them and all the details of having to take that ointment and put it on top of the head and make sure all the bugs aren't there. And You don't want all those bugs on top of the head because then you have the flies and then the flies start getting up in the nose and they lay the eggs and then those little worms get out and they get all in the brain and then they go crazy. That's a type of demon possession, by the way. When you study devils in the Bible, they're winged creatures. They'll get in your head. And so he puts that oil on that sheep. He anoints the head with oil, a type of the Holy Spirit to keep the devil off of you. But Abel's all in the details, and he's nurturing, and he's caring, and he's building up, and he's taking care of these animals. Cain's a tiller. Abel is a keeper. Completely total different mindsets. Now, I'm not saying somebody that gardens and somebody does that can't be a nurturer. Don't get me wrong. I like gardening and planting and flowers and all that kind of stuff too. That's a great noble task. I'm just, salvation will deliver you. And so we have a con- contrasting thing here. Abel brings of the flock, Cain brings of his fruit. And so we have Abel, the Bible calls him a man of faith. So if the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abel by faith brought a more excellent sacrifice, that tells me that Cain did not have faith. Cain was doing what he was doing by sight. He's thinking, you know what? Them turnips, man, they look good. Look what I, all this work, I've kept all the bugs off of them. I don't know what time of the year it was, but he had it all set up, and he had it where it looked nice, and he's just thinking, if I was God, I would think this was a good offering. If I was God, there's no way I would kill an innocent lamb and put that blood over there. If I was God, there's no way... I would do certain things a certain way. There's no way I would judge people by sending Israel into the land and wiping out all those other nations. If I was a good God, this thing just keeps rolling. And see, Cain is just formulating God according to his own ideas. You better be careful in your contemplation because you can think God right outside of the Bible and you can get away from God by creating your own God. That's why it's so important to be in the Bible. You need to be in the Bible and you need to be a theologian, practically speaking. Not a theologian like these knuckleheads in these cemeteries, or I should say seminaries, but somebody that knows what the Bible says about God. You don't just need to know what, what, about God by based on what people have told you about God. They could be lying to you. They could just tell you what they've heard about God. Well, you know, God, whether it's a he or whether it's a she... Some people think God's female. Nothing against you ladies, but God is not a female. God, wow, I thought I'd get a few more amens than that. God, the Holy Spirit is male. God, the Son is male. God, the Father is male. Amen Amen and amen. Amen. Or I should say amen. (laughs) In the South, we say amen. So we have Cain and we have Abel. We have a contrast between faith and between sight. And that whole idea of sight is seeing things... Man sees it, and Cain sees it the way he wants to see it. And he envisions that God's going to be pleased with his sacrifice, and because he's done built it all up in his own mind, boy, is he disappointed. I wonder how many of us are going to be disappointed at the judgment seat of Christ because we done got this whole thing envisioned a certain way. You need to start seeing things the way God sees it. 
Live by faith, not by sight. Cain's just walking by sight. Oh, this is how it's going to be. So he brings the fruit of his ground. Abel's got his offering. He's got his flock. Abel is being obedient because I believe, like I told you, that this has been passed down. I believe Abel is being obedient to God, what God requires for fellowship, and that is a blood sacrifice. If Abel's being obedient, Cain is being rebellious. Preacher, he's sincere. They're sincere down at the Jehovah's Witness place. Then they're out knocking on doors. They're sincere down at the mosque. Rebellious. God says, this is the way. Walk in it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, I'm just going to do it my way. Well, you're being rebellious. If Abel has belief, then Cain has unbelief. And look in verse number 7. The Lord tells him, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So he's telling him, saying, look, if you do this, you can get things right. But if not, you can keep going down. The Bible calls it the way of Cain. Cain brought the fruit. Abel brought the flock. Abel's a keeper. Cain's a tiller. Notice the next thing here. Abel is respected. Abel was respected. His offering was respected. Cain's was rejected. Verses 4 and 5. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Abel's offering is appropriate. Cain's offering is appalling. The very idea of somebody would bring fruit, the fruit of the ground, probably turnips. That's why we get the, you know, you can't get a blood from the turnip saying from that. We just say that. But whatever he brought, he brought the fruit of the ground, and that's appalling to God. God's like, what are you bringing this to me for? There's no blood in that. God requires a blood sacrifice. Although we know from Hebrews it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Sin cannot be removed, but those animals, they typified the Lamb of God which would come, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reason behind the purification of those animal sacrifices. There had to be blood shed because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And the only way that our sins could be removed the bloodshed, not just of a person, but of a sinless person. And there's no sinless person of the descendants of Adam. Jesus Christ had to be virgin born to be God and man. So when he died on the cross, his blood, God's blood, could make the atonement for the soul. Somebody says, well, you know, this, all this singing about the blood and all this is, is kind of just, you know, uh, uh, barbaric. Well... The life of the flesh is in the blood. Without blood, you're dead. And so Jesus Christ, when he sheds his blood, it's God's blood flowing through his veins, and that's called a propitiation, a satisfactory sacrifice, and it's appropriated when you believe. It's appropriate sacrifice, but it's appropriated. That means that thing's applied to your account when you believe on it. It's almost like you're taking the offering when you receive Christ. As your Savior. So, obviously, Abel's was respected. Cain's was rejected. Now, Cain's offering was bloodless. We got that. Cain mistook beauty for blood. His altar is surrounded by beauty. Abel's offering was surrounded by blood. And I don't care who the theologian is that says, well, you know, it's just Jesus' death that saves you. The Bible puts emphasis on the blood of Christ. And the reason we have a problem with these new Bible versions is because they attack or they remove or they downplay the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you have a religion that downplays the blood of Jesus Christ, you have a devil's religion. Very dangerous. The Bible says it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. I like singing those songs, What Can Wash Away My Sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. Cain's offering is bloodless. Cain's offering is powerless. It didn't help him a bit. No power at all. And Cain's offering is godless. He mistook reason for revelation. He thought, I spent a lot of time on it. This is a great sacrifice. I did all of this for God. Really, when you study salvation, it's not about what you do for God. Salvation is about what God do, does for you. You see, God gave life to the Lamb. 
So when the life has been, been took from the lamb, it shows that this lamb that God gave life to, the blood has been shed instead of Abel's blood being shed and Abel having to die, this lamb has died instead. Cain brings his offering and it's, look what I did. He's reasoning this out. I'm going to work really, really hard and I'm going to do this and I'm going to show this is what all I can do for God. And so that is the reasoning behind Cain's mistake. And it's godless. You see, we don't understand what it means to be godless, but this is the root of it. To be godless is to take away God. In Psalm 10, the Bible says the wicked, it says, when you read that passage, boasteth of his heart's desire, it says this, God is not in all of his thoughts. If you remove God, it's godless. Now think about our society. We're living in what's called the post-Christian era. We have a few remnants here and there, but by and large, as far as Christianity having an impact on the culture, that's, we're, that's, that's over. We're living in a godless society. Matter of fact, we're moving from godless to anti-God society. Godless. Abel's offering is appropriate, it's accepted, it's anticipated as far as Christ's offering goes. I've probably read this before, I'll read it again, this religion poem. First dentistry was painless, then bicycles were chainless, and carriages were horseless, and many laws enforceless. Next cookery was fireless, uh, telegraphy was wireless, cigars were nicotineless, and coffee caffeineless. Soon oranges were seedless. The putting green was weedless, the college boy hatless, the proper diet fatless. Now motor roads are dustless, the latest steel is rustless, our tennis courts are sodless, our new religion godless. (laughs) It's amazing how many people open Bibles, come to churches and do religion, and God's nowhere within 50 feet of that place. If Jesus Christ isn't lifted up, if the Bible's not magnified, if the gospel of Christ is not preached, it's godless. And so we have a contrast between these two men that shows you religion and salvation, but also I want you to see that Abel here is the victor and Cain is the victim. Abel is the victor because we know from the heroes of the faith, we know he's one of the faithful. I believe we'll see Abel in heaven one day. I believe we'll get to talk to him and say, what was it like? You know, to be back there and have Adam and Eve for your mother and father and those kind of things. He's listed in Hebrews chapter 11. He's one of the first ones, the heroes of the faith. By faith, Abel offered a sacrifice, acceptable to God, and so on and so forth. So Abel is the victor, but Cain is the victim. Abel is righteous. Cain is wicked. Abel is wise. Cain is a scorner. Now in Proverbs 13 verse 1, it says this, A wise son... Heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. A scorner will not listen to rebuke. Proverbs 21 verse 24, Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. And then Proverbs 15, 12, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Cain is a scorner, he is wicked. Notice in the text, As soon as his offering in verse number 5 is not accepted, his countenance fell. That has to do with the expression on his face. Now some of you, you know, you're always joyful. You always walk around. You put a plastic smile on your face. Some of you, you sit there and your resting face looks like you're ready to kill somebody. You're just sitting there like this. Go ahead, make my day, you know, kind of thing. Um... And sometimes you can notice people and they're, they're joyful, they're happy, and then all of a sudden some news hits them or, or something happens in their life or, or they get some news and all of a sudden their, their, their expression on their face tells it. And this is exactly what happened to Cain. As soon as God did not respect his offering, but he respected and answered by fire his brother's offering, you could tell it. It ticked him off immediately, his response. That's a scorner. That's a wicked person. When God reproves you, listen to this first of all. Just like this morning message, I mean, we got, might have dug taters a little bit and dealt with some worldliness and things like that, but we need that kind of stuff. When the Lord deals with us about that kind of stuff, it's because He loves us. 
You young people in here, when your parents correct you, aren't you tired of being corrected all the time? It's like you never can do anything right, didn't make my bed up right, didn't eat all your eggs, didn't do this, didn't do that, didn't do that. Why are they always getting on to you? They're getting on to you, they're correcting you because they love you. Because they're trying to straighten something out that's naturally crooked. Young people, you're naturally crooked. All of us are. And you have to be corrected. And so you have to understand my parents love me so they're telling me this. Same thing. The Lord loves us. Whom He loveth, He chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. If He didn't love you, He'd just be like, you know, sometimes you see kids that are just going wild in the stores and here they are, you know, they go out and they're running in front of cars and everything. What's the problem? I'll tell you what. Their parents are good for nothing. That's the problem. If they were good parents, they'd be wearing out their hind end. Why? Because they would not want them to get hurt. It takes effort, it takes discipline, it takes time to have to correct a child that's crooked. And all children are crooked. So parents are always working. I don't envy you it, uh, one bit. But you have to remember, if the Lord is correcting, that means He loves you. So when He rebukes you and He comes across hard and says, Hey, you're wrong on this. Don't just buck up at Him and get mad at Him. You can tell it with young people sometimes how they take to uh, correction. Whether they're a victim or a victor. And I don't know what it is, and I'm, I'm assuming it's just how kids are trained at home. But I was trained at home to respect adults. And you go somewhere and an adult speaks and you do what that adult tells you to do. You don't, you know, say, well, I got my rights and how dare you talk to me and I'm going to get my daddy to come beat up you and I'm going to do this. And The teachers are always wrong. The police are always wrong. The other adults that have to get on to your snotty kids because they're running out in the road are always wrong. There's, uh, that's, that's not right. That mentality is you're raising cane, little canes. And as soon as Cain is corrected, he... He uh, bucks up. That's what I'm looking at. Sometimes you see it in these little kids. They start, huh? What? Talking to adults just like they talk to everybody else. No, you don't talk to adults. You, you speak when you're spoken to. I, t I talk tough like this, but all you little kids, you know, I'll let you talk to me. I'm not. But we've, we've gotten this idea that there's no hierarchy. There is hierarchy. And without some type of hierarchy, you have chaos. And Cain, he has this mentality that, Lord, I did all of this and you should have accepted this. Lord, why did you do this to me? Don't you know who I am? The Lord's like, yeah, another dirt ball, just like all these other dirt balls. If you have a real high estimation of yourself, just don't take a bath for about two weeks and see how you smell. Amen. There you go. That's your flesh. Cain, the scorner. Somebody said, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. Now, I believe Cain rejected revelation first and foremost when it came through Adam. So he's rejecting the word of God through his dad. His dad told him, if you're going to approach unto God, it seems from the story, you'll notice from back in chapter 3 when you read about uh, uh, this cherubim and the flaming sword, and then you read in chapter number 4 about Cain when he says, I'm going to be hid from your face. There's almost like a place where they would come designated to approach to be able to fellowship with God. And so revelation has been given from Adam and it's been passed down to Cain, and Cain rejected what his daddy told him. He had to have. And then he rejects the second revelation when he sees Abel coming up. And here's Cain. He's got his wheelbarrow and he's wheeling all, these, uh, wheeling all these vegetables in. And here's Abel bringing all these sheep, you know. <laughs> he should have been like, uh-oh, I brought the wrong thing. Let me go over here. Let me go see if Abel's got some extra sheep. And that's the second thing he should have clued him in. You walk into a church and everybody's walking in with their Bibles and here you are just walking around like, I'm going to watch the screen today. There's no screen up here. You need to have your Bible because we're going to look in the Bible. This is called a church. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open it up. There's all the people. In the Bible somewhere. <laughs> in there. He, that should have been a clue. Here's Abel with the sheep. I blew it. I need to fix this thing before I offer the offering. I'll be back in just a minute. 
Not even thinking. You don't realize when you go around and you pray before you eat somewhere and you're out maybe at work and you take a break and you got your Bible or you talk about the Lord or just a small thing, you don't realize the testimony you might be to somebody that needs to see that. And that may be God speaking through you and through your life, giving another nudge, another revelation to say, aren't you supposed to be doing this? On your break, aren't you supposed to be reading your Bible like other Christians? Aren't you supposed to be praying over your food like other Christians? Aren't you supposed to be inviting people to church like this guy invited you to church? Aren't you supposed to be witnessing to people and passing out tracts? It ought to be another revelation. So your life preaches a greater sermon than I could ever preach because we're confined by these four walls. And so that was the second revelation. Then the third revelation was when he saw that fire fall on Abel's offering. And he knew that God respected Abel's offering. And I don't know if he did what the prophets of Baal did, if he ran around the thing crying and cutting himself. You remember the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 17? They're cutting their, their wrists and stuff, 1 Kings 18. And they're calling for, I don't know if he did that. Maybe he's trying to get some blood to fall on the sacrifice. I don't know what he's doing. But God never respected his offering. Outside of that, Move it a step further. The Lord approaches him, not Cain approaching the Lord. You would have thought Cain would have been like, I blew it. Let me go talk to the Lord about this thing. Lord, I messed up. Can I have a redo? Can I go and bring another offering? I'll get rid of the turnips and stuff. And uh, can I? Cain doesn't go talk to God about it. It's the Lord who talks to Cain. That shows you the mercy of God. You can find God's grace and mercy all through the Bible. The Lord already told him what he wanted. He already showed it. He gave a a vivid illustration by accepting Abel's offering. You know what the Lord will do in your life? He'll show you some other Christian and not to get you to compare your life and you get in trouble when you're always comparing. However, he will give you someone other than just King David to look at. He'll give you somebody in the here and now. And he'll say, see there? if, If I can do that through them, I can do that through you. Look at that. Instead of Cain going and talking to the Lord about it, he gets mad, so then the Lord takes it a step further and actually approaches Cain and says, Cain, why are you so sad? What's the matter? Cain, if you, if you do right, I would accept your offering if you bring the right offering just like I accept everybody else's offering. So what does that do? It does nothing for Cain. You can't, you can't reprove a scorner. Some will, some won't. Some wait, so what? Some people you try to help and you can't help them. Cain is not going to take rebuke. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. What happens? Well, verse 8. Cain talks with Abel. Okay, that's great. He's going to make things right. No, he's approaching Abel. But it doesn't say anything in the text, and I'm reading into it, about Abel talking to Cain. Cain is approaching Abel. You think he would go up and say, Look, Abe, is it possible I could, uh, you know, borrow a sheep? Can I have one of these little lambs? I sure would like to be able to take a sacrifice to the Lord. I guarantee Abel would have said, sure, you can have one. But for Cain to stoop down and put his pride down and go to his brother who had the nerve to have, and he's the younger brother, to have his offering accepted and mine's been rejected, I'm not going to do that. I can just hear Cain. He's just stewing over that thing and he gets madder and madder because he's full of hatred, he's full of envy, he's full of jealousy, and he's full of bitterness. When God got on to him, it didn't make him better. When he saw the fire fall down and he saw God bless Abel, it didn't make him better. Let me tell you something. When you see God bless another Christian, you ought to be excited and happy for that Christian. Man, when things are going good and the Lord's blessing them and they've got the joy, 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 joy down in their heart and they're singing the victory and they've got a smile on their face and things are going good in their family and their life, you ought to be excited for them. Instead, you know what some Christians do? They try to pick them apart. Paul says, take heed that you don't bite and devour one another. Well, yeah, they, they sang pretty good this morning, but you know what? They missed Sunday school last week. I was here. I was criticizing everybody while I was here, but I was here. I was sitting in the back so I could look at everybody, see who was here and who wasn't here. Then I moved down front so everybody could see that I was here. I'd preach if the preacher let me. 
that critical spirit. Cain is just eat up with it. He went and talked to his brother. What did he talk to him about? Doesn't tell us. But you know, when you kind of look at the text, one thing leads to another, and it's like the conversation gets heated. Look at, look at the verse. Cain talked with Abel's brother, verse number 8, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. He killed his own brother. That's how deep his hatred and his bitterness and his envy and his jealousy went. The way he rose up and killed him. The Bible says, Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, 1 John three twelve. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Cain did good, so you know what that did? It made, I mean, Abel did good, so it made Cain look bad. That's why if you, and I'm not getting on to some of you that are just mediocre workers, but I'll say this, if you halfway show up on time and do a good job, you're going to be the most outstanding employee of the month because nobody's doing their jobs anymore. And then if you go a step above that and you actually do a good job, you're going to be like owning the company in three months. But people that see you show up on time, people see you not take extra break and see you not steal the paper clips and see you go above and beyond, they don't like that because it's going to make them look bad. And if you're a loafer and if you're an entitled generation and if you are a victim, if you're born always being the victim like Cain, then you're just going to be eat up with jealousy, eat up with bitterness, eat up with envy. And you can't stand it when somebody outdoes you. I tell you what, you want to get a good dose when we have our fall picnic of humiliation, why don't you play the cornhole tournament? I get frustrated. Me and Brother Bruce, we did okay, but man, I did so much better in practice than I did in the actual tournament. Man, I was knocking them out, man. I don't know how many I got, but in practice, I did pretty good. And we got in the little thing, I was just, so, just awful at it. There's something about my hand-eye coordination, throwing that stupid little beanbag thing, that I can't make it work. Then somebody else comes along and does great at it. If you're super competitive, that will bother you. <laughs> but you know, Cain was eat up with this jealousy and how good Abel was. It made him look bad, so he killed him. His religion at first hindered him, but in the end, his religion hardened him. He stuck by what he did, and he went to hell with that. Okay, he never got better. He only got bitter. As soon as he was rejected, he got mad, and he, he stewed on that, and his anger kept with him. When God rebuked him, he got madder. When God drove him out, and he had to go live in the city. He couldn't be a farmer anymore. He had to go build the first city. So how do you know cities are of the devil? There's your first city right there. He had to start shopping in a grocery store instead of growing his own food. And man, when that happened, it just only got worse. Cain had the same chance as Abel, but he did not take God up on his offer. And he became a fugitive and a vagabond. He's always crying out. The Lord punishes him. You would think God would say, okay, you took your brother's life, I'm going to take your life. But God doesn't enact capital punishment until after the flood. When you read Genesis chapter number 9, after Noah and his sons get off the ark, he tells them, okay, here's some new rules here. I'm going to allow you to eat meat. Amen. Okay? 1,600 years, man just ate vegetables. He said, I'm going to allow you to eat meat. And also, if a man kills another man, if he sheds his blood because I originally made man in my image, you're going to take that man's life. Capital punishment is instituted in Genesis chapter number 9. And that thing follows all through the Bible. Under the, before the Old Testament law was given, under Noah's time, during the Old Testament law, under Moses' time, and then even now in the New Testament dispensation, Paul the Apostle makes the statement in Acts 26, if I've committed any offense worthy of death, I refuse not to die. It's all through the Bible. But here, God does not take Cain's life. You'd think he'd be a little bit happy. Okay, I just killed my brother and you're letting me off. Yeah, I've got to go out and do this, but at least I'm still alive. No, he gets mad and complains about that. What are you going to do? Somebody's going to come after me. You're going to send me out. He's always the victim. Poor Cain. And so the Lord puts a mark on him and sends him out. You'll notice in verse number 11, his damnation. 
He's cursed. You'll notice in verses 13 and 14, his despair. You'll notice in verse number 16, his dwelling. Look at that. What a bad place to be. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. So, well, I'm just going to keep this bitterness. I'm just going to keep this, this hatred. Verse 16 is where you're going to live. Take your religion, take your hardness, take your bitterness. Verse 16, you're not going to be in the presence of the Lord because in the presence of the Lord, you have to lay that stuff down. And then notice his doom in verse number 15. He's got this mark put on him. He's marked. Cain's a type of the Antichrist. He has this mark, like the mark of the beast. Cain's also compared in Romans 13, or compared, if you can read Romans 13, to what's called the weaker brother. And Paul talks about the weaker brother not offending the weaker brother. And he says, you know, certain things you don't need to do. You know, if, if, if a brother observes a certain day, then don't, don't eat certain foods on that day because you might offend that brother. And he keeps going on. The whole thing in Romans 13 about not offending. But here's the thing about the weaker brother. The weaker brother always thinks he's stronger. Thinks he's better. And that's how Cain was. The weaker brother judges by appearance and fails to distinguish between the outward act and the inward attitude. Cain still in his mind thought, I had the best offering. Even after all of that, he was still trying to justify himself. When God sent him away, he's barking and he's going away in his rebellion and in his sin and in his self-justification. And there he is. And what does he, what does he raise? He, raise? he raises a bunch of Cain's. So what is Cain? Cain's a backstabber. And he wanders aimlessly without purpose. Verses 10 through 12, he loses his purpose. His purpose, like I mentioned this morning, was to worship and serve God. Somebody's got to grow the vegetables. And it's a great thing to do, but those vegetables are not to be brought for the sacrifice. Now there comes a time in Israel's history where they do bring the fruit of the ground as an offering when you have some of the sacrifices as far as the different uh, feast days and that has to do with the tithe. And so they do have that. But as far as atonement being made for the soul, there has to be bloodshed for the atonement for the soul. So the fruits of the ground have their place. There's a place for a tithe. There's a place for the turnips. But it's not at that sacrifice. And Cain lost his whole purpose and his whole point, and he was sent away from God because of his rebellion and because of being a scorner. What can we learn from this? Well, hopefully we can learn not to be a critical spirit like Cain. Let's just do what God told us to do. Let's try to encourage each other to do what God told us to do. If God rings your bell and God gets on to you, instead of bucking up, instead of getting mad and thinking that, how come the Lord don't do such and such? He makes the rules. We are to follow those rules. Who are we? God made us. Who are we to set the precedent? We should be thankful He created us in the first place, saved us in the second place, gave us a life to live in order to give back something to Him in the third place. Let's don't be critical. Let's don't worry about trying to justify ourselves with our religion, let's worry on building our relationship by doing what God tells us to do. That's living by faith instead of living by sight. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great contrast.